Okay, so let me start you off with a, a little puzzle um, or question. So um, remember uh, how we got to recall how we derived uh, the mean value theorem. The mean value theorem, um, uh, we started off with Rolle's theorem, right? which said something like this, right? if your function starts and ends at the same height, then there's some place where the derivative is zero. Right? There's some place where the derivative is zero. So Rolle's theorem said this, right? there's some place where the derivative is zero. And then for the mean value theorem, we said, suppose your function doesn't start and end at the same heights. Right? But your function goes something like this. Right? Then there's some place where the there's some place where the slope equals the slope of the line through, through the endpoints. Right? Does anyone remember how we got that? Does anyone, anyone remember how how Rolle's theorem gave us gave us the main value there? Uh, Wynn, go ahead. Oh, um, so let me take the, the tangent line and equal it to. Um, a, wait, so I can't Anybody prompted? Anybody's brain uh, sort of stimulated by Wynn's comment? Nico, you look like you. It was like f, like f of a minus f of b over b minus a or something like that. Or like as x equals to zero. Anyone, anyone remember? So what we did um, was we took our f and then we made a new function. We said, let's make a new function L, right? The line, the line function, right? And then we, Isaac? That's like d of x minus f of x. Right. We said, let d be the difference guy, right? Let d be the difference guy. And what that did was create a function, the difference guy, so which went like this. Oops. Right? Looks like this. It's the difference between the function and, and the line. So here, right, the difference is zero. The, func the difference becomes bigger, becomes smaller, becomes negative, becomes zero, becomes bigger, becomes smaller, becomes zero again. Right? And we said, uh, use, use Rolle's theorem on, on D. Right? Use Rolle's theorem on D. That gives us a place where the slope of D was zero. Right? to get uh, where the slope of d is zero, right? But where the slope of d is zero is where the slope of f equals the slope of l. And the slope of l is the slope of this line here. OK. OK. Everyone, so that, that's, that's all stuff that we did before. It, does anyone have any questions on that? Anyone, does anyone? Uh, Clear on that? Okay, so here's the here's the question. Okay. So um, suppose we have uh, again a function that goes like this, f, and then we have another function, say, that starts and ends at the same points, g. So we have another function that starts and ends at the same points. Um, what can we get out of that? Can you can you see if you can see if you can get something some fact about these two functions? Some fact about these two functions. The derivative of these two functions. Sort of along the lines of, of what we did uh, in the previous question. I'm gonna walk around. I'm gonna go outside.
talk to somebody for just a few seconds. <laughs> Okay, anybody, anybody come up with something? I'm sorry, it's passing Norm. Sound like you were saying something? You're shaking your head though? <laughs> no, no. Well, I, is there any place where they're both zero? Any place where what's both zero? The derivative. Where the derivatives are both zero. So you're saying, like, um, there's this point where f of c and g of c are both zero. Is that what you're saying? No, not at the same point. You're saying that um, there exists different points where the slopes are, are, are zero. Well, what do people think about that? Do you think that, that has do you, do you think that has to happen if you have two functions and um, uh, let me say it this way, you've got two cars and they both uh, they're on a track and they both start and end at the same point. Does that would that force um, right so you've got two two cars um, they both start at, at the same point and they both end at the same point but they go at different velocities okay I mean, they could go at the same velocity <coughs> um, f of a and g of a they start at the same point f of b g of b they start at the end at the same point does that mean that they had to stop along the way if they if they start and end at the same points no right there's no reason why they had to stop they would have to stop so, um, um, who, 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 who wants to talk? Anybody want to talk? Isaac? There's a place where the two functions are, there's, on that graph, there's two places where the functions are equal. Where the two fun where the functions are equal, okay. But does that have to happen? No. If I've got two functions that began and end at the same point, do they have to be equal at any point? Well, no, right? Because one guy could go forwards, you know, one guy could go like this, one guy could go like this. Um, Sarah first, and then when? There's a point on both f and g where the derivative is the slope between a and b. So there's a point on a b where f of c equals this thing, and g of c equals the same thing. It doesn't necessarily have to be the same. So separate points. So there's yeah, this C1 points. and C2 yeah. where where this happens. Okay, so um, so what you're saying is that, um, well, if you apply the mean value theorem to one of the guys, then you know that there's some point C where, where this slope equals that, right? And you apply the mean value theorem to the other guy, there's a C2 where where that where that happens, so that's that's true, but that's actually not uh, that's true, but that's not the uh, magnificent thing that I'm looking for. <laughs> okay, uh, when? Um, well, you can tell they have the same average slope because they both have the same um, uh, secant line. Is okay, so they do certainly. They both have the same uh, secant line. Uh, and if you use um, mean or mean value theorem, and, uh, and you set the difference between the secant line and the function and they're both going to f of x is going to end up equal, equal in g of x. Oh, okay. Okay, so, um, so I think what you're saying is that uh, uh, consider f of x minus g of x, right? Okay, and you say, well, look, this function is, is zero at the beginning and zero at the end, right? Because the difference is zero at the beginning and this, the difference is zero at the end. So let's again call this thing d, call this thing d. D, is, D of A is zero, D of B is zero. And so what does that tell you? That tells you that there's a place, um, there's a place where uh, D, D prime is zero, right? In other words, there's a place, i.e., where F prime equals G prime. Okay, right? So if two cars start and end at the same same positions, then 
then what, what this is saying is that there's some point in time where their velocities are exactly the same. There's got to be some point in that time period where they are traveling exactly the same velocity. Okay, and that's 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 what I was looking for. That's, that is what I was looking for. Does anyone does everyone s fo follow follow this thing? We're basically doing the same thing as here. We look at the difference, right? You look at the difference and you say, well, by Wolf's theorem, the derivative must be zero somewhere, right? So you say, okay, look at the difference. By Wolf's theorem, the difference must be the the derivative must be zero someplace. That means that the instantaneous velocities are exactly the same. Okay. Great. Okay. I should give you a bonus for that. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. So uh, the last the last puzzle I'm not gonna I'm not gonna <coughs> do for you, but it's this it's like this. Suppose you have two functions. And all you know is that you know, you've got two functions. That's it. And you don't know that they began at the same place or ended at the same place or anything like that. Okay. Then what can you conclude? Okay. It turns out that you can you can you can mess around with it a little bit and play roles theorem again, and what you get is the following. You know, so this is um, something called the generalized mean value theorem, or the theorem of the mean value theorem of Cauchy. Uh, the French mathematician who, I guess, thought it up. Um, it's this. Um, what what can you what can you conclude what can you conclude about the cars? Something kind of funny. There exists a time where the ratio of the instantaneous velocities equals. the ratio of the average velocities. The ratio of the instantaneous velocities equals the ratio of the average velocities. You don't have to know this. You don't have to know this. It's just sort of cool. And this is actually uh, what one uses to get the rule that we're going to show today, L'Hopital's rule. So this is this is actually the, the machinery underlying L'Hopital's rule, although we're not going to talk about it. I just want to show it to you. If you want to try and get it, you can try. It's, uh, the trick is is this. Um, uh, uh, you multiply you multiply one of them by a factor in order to twist it so that they end up. Uh, so you multiply one of them by a factor to scale it. So that they end up at the same same differences at beginning and end, and then you apply rules theorem to the difference between that guy and this and the and this and the scaling guy. Anyway. anyway, okay. So today we're going to talk about L'Hopital's rule, which was really created by one of the Bernoullis. <coughs> So there's a fa famous mathematical family, the Bernoulli family. There's lots of lots of mathematicians named Bernoulli. Um, one of them made L'Hopital's rule, but um, he was, I think, I, I think the story is that uh, he was sponsored by L'Hopital, like he was being paid by L'Hopital, and um, had some sort of contract where anything that he he came up with was was going to be put under L'Hopital's name, and so it's under L'Hopital's name. Some some, some there's some, some story like that. Okay. okay. So um, what it says is the following, that under some conditions, then uh, the limit of f of x over g of x as x approaches um, some point equals the limit of the derivatives as x approaches that point. Okay, and I'll fill in the, fill in the blank right now. So if um, f and g are differentiable on some interval 
um, not containing C. And the limit of f of x as x approaches C is 0. The limit of g of x as x approaches C is 0. Then, then the limit of the quotient is the limit of the quotients of the derivative, the quotient of the derivative. Um, what's that symbol between A, B, and C? Not including, so excluding, excluding the point C. Those of you who are curious, you, you can, if you look at the generalized mean value theorem, um, notice that I can cancel these things out. Right? I don't need to put in these b minus a's. That just, that's, as a fraction, that just cancel out. Why did I put them in there? Um, OK. And you notice that if f of a is 0 and g of a is 0, then what this is saying is that f of c, f prime of c over g prime of c is f of b over g of b. Right? Now it's starting to look a little bit more like, like something to do with the L'Hopital's rule. Right, a quotient, you've got a quotient of values here, you've got a quotient of derivatives here. Okay. And it will, it will give us what we call zero. Okay, so, um, so for example, um, here's a simple one that we've seen before in a few ways. Right, the limit of sine x over x, what was it? We saw this before, what is this? One. It's one, right? We know this is one. We did this using the, the squeeze theorem, right? And maybe in some other way as well. I don't remember. Okay, but now we're doing it, in, we're doing it another way. You say, well, look, L'Hopital's rule says, um, uh, so look, the limit of the top is zero, and the limit of the bottom is zero, right? So L'Hopital's rule says, Right. So, L'Hopital's rule <laughs> says that the limit of this is the limit of the quotient, the quotient of the the derivatives. Right. Well, the derivative of the top is cosine. The derivative of the bottom is one. Right. So you just say. The limit of, of f over g equals the limit of f prime over g prime, right? And what's this? As cosine, I'm sorry, as x goes to zero, what happens to cosine? Becomes one, okay? So you get one. Okay. Another example, limit of sine 3x over sine 2x as x goes to zero. Again, we can use L'Hopital's, L'Hopital's rule on it because as x goes to zero, the top goes to zero, and the bottom goes to zero, right? So it turns into a zero over zero form. Right? And uh, take 30 seconds and, and see, what, see what happens.
Luke, go ahead. Oh, no, I don't know. No? Okay. okay. Thanks, All right. All right. <laughs> Um, somebody from this left side here? I feel like you guys are all looking like you want, you know it. Uh, Nora, go ahead. Is it three over two? Is it three over two? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Right, and how do you get it? Well, you take, you say, well, look, you know, this is, you know, you've got zero over something that goes to zero over something that goes to zero. So you can, this is going to be equal to the limit of the derivatives. What's the derivative of the top? Well, you get um, cosine 3x times 3, right, by the chain, by the chain rule, right, over, and then you can differentiate the bottom, you get cosine 2x times 2, right, and then as x goes to 0, this goes to, th the top goes to 3 and the bottom goes to 2, right? because cosine of 0 is 1, cosine of 0 is 1, right? so you get 3 over 2. This was actually a problem that you did already, I think, in your homework. But if you did it, you probably did it by, um, you know, uh, ages ago when we when we had this when we first introduced this thing using the squeeze theorem. Um, if you did it at that time, you probably had to pull a trick, right? And you said, "I'm going to divide the top. Um, I'm going to throw in a one." There are a couple of weird looking ones. Right? I'm going to multiply the top by one. I'm going to multiply the bottom by one. Right? And then say this thing goes to one, and this thing goes to one, and this thing goes to three halves. Right? That's, that's, if you did it at that time, you had to do something like that. You probably did something like that. Okay. Um, okay. So using the Pitol's rule, you know, pretty easy, right? Um, uh, Often, uh, you know, uh, in the homeworks, maybe to indicate you're using L'Hopital's rule, put an <coughs> H. You know, people usually put an H over the, over the equal sign. Like this equals by L'Hopital's rule, you know, this thing. Uh, that's not necessary, but it's a convenience. Um, okay. Okay. So, um, so I should I should fix up. This this part a little bit a little bit more, okay. So you can have other possibilities. So this thing could also be, um, or the limit of f of x as x approaches c is plus or minus infinity, and the limit of g of x is also plus or minus infinity. Okay. So they it doesn't have to be that they both go to zero they could both go to some positive or negative infinity. And it does, they could be different signs. One could go to positive infinity, the other to negative infinity, you know, whatever. Right. <coughs> but if they both go to some sort of infinity, then, um, then, you, uh, then you can apply Lipitol's rule. Okay. Um, okay. Let's see. As you approach, as you approach some value. And then the last thing that, that you can do could also have um, uh, f and g differentiable, uh, and c could be plus or minus infinity. Okay. So c, this point c, may not be a finite point. So first I introduced L'Hopital's rule just using all finite stuff, but there's also s some infinite, there's also a, a version where you throw in infinity. The, the values of the top and bottom could approach infinity. The, the, the point that you're approaching could be infinity also. So for example, if I look at um, the limit of x cubed over e of the x as x goes to infinity, Uh, this is something where you've got, you know, the top goes to infinity and the bottom goes to infinity, right? And so you can use L'Hopital's rule on it. By L'Hopital's rule, this equals the limit as x goes to infinity of what? Of what? Somebody just tell me. 3x squared over e to the x. 3x squared over e to the x, right? Now, 
that's still infinity over infinity, right? <coughs> so I'm going to use L'Hopital's rule again and say, by L'Hopital's rule, that equals the limit of the derivative on the top over the derivative of the bottom. But that's still infinity over infinity, so I'm going to use L'Hopital's rule again, right? And I get 6 over e to the x. Well, that's not infinity, infinity over infinity anymore, but that's okay. I can evaluate this, right? As x goes to infinity, what happens to this? You get zero, right? You get zero. Okay. And so that tells you by this long string of L'Hopital's rule that the initial thing goes to zero. Right? By L'Hopital's rule, this limit equals this, which equals this, which equals this, and we know what this is. It's zero. Okay. So this thing is zero. Um, anything, anything, anything interesting about that? So certainly, I, it's a it's an application of L'Hopital's rule. But does that seem sort of interesting to you in any way? What can you can you go a little bit farther than that? X cubed over e to the x, you know, that the limit of that is zero. We can actually stretch what we just did, you know, like just a tiny bit more, and say what. Suppose I have any polynomial on the top. Yeah. X to the million plus five, X to the X to the you know, one hundred thousand, et cetera, et cetera. Win first. Go ahead. Um, any any polynomial over E V X uh, as X approaches infinity is going to equal zero? That's right. That's right. So you see what happens, right? We might have to differentiate a million times. Right? We'd apply L'Hopital's rule a million times, but in the end, we get some number over e to the x. Right? And so you get zero. Right? So you know, just to put it more simply, right? if, if I pick x to any, any power, right? <coughs> whatever, and that goes to infinity, right? well, I use L'Hopital's rule lots of times. Right? I get 10. So a huge number on the top, but it's a constant, right? And so that's zero. Right? You get some huge, <laughs> you get some constant on the top, right? Um, and you, get, you get some constant on the top over over e to the x as e to the x goes to infinity, e is zero, right? So what this says is that if you think of this as a race, e to the x beats any polynomial, right? e to the x goes to infinity a lot faster than, than any polynomial, right? Any polynomial I put on the top here, if you look at the ratio, e to the x is going to, you know, the ratio goes to zero, okay? And vice versa, if e to the x were on the top, right, then this thing would always go to infinity. If I put, it, if I put a huge polynomial on the bottom and try to, you know, think, oh, maybe this polynomial will control e to the x, no, it will never, it will never work, right? e to the x beats, beats all polynomials. And so um, you can think of L'Hopital's rule as sort of like a way, uh, as some sort of arbiter of the race, right? Um, you say, well, look, the top's going to infinity. The bottom's going to infinity, right? But in fact, the bottom is going to infinity faster, right? And that's what L'Hopital's rule tells you, right? That, that it has to do with the speed, the derivative, right? has to do with the speed, you know, even though the top is infinity. So, you know, as a kid, you might think, oh, this, the top's going to infinity and the bottom's going to infinity. Uh, you know, what can I say more about it? But in fact, this turns out to be zero. Okay. Um, okay. Another sort of similar statement. Uh, let's say natural log of x over x, x squared is x goes to infinity. Okay. Take Take one minute and see if you can see what happens to it.
there's somebody nearby and say this turns into something. Okay, who would like to say something? Mena, how about you? Um, is it zero? Is it zero? Tell me, tell me why you think it's zero. Okay, so um, I took the derivative. So the, the derivative of the natural log of x is 1 over x, hmm? and then the bottom would be 2x, hmm. right? The mm -hmm. derivative of the bottom. And so basically, then like you organize that, um, I got one over two x squared, mm -hmm. and you, we, and then so when you put that in, like when you put infinity into that, it would be like one over infinity. Mm -hmm. and that would be zero. Exactly. Great. Yeah. Um. Okay. Uh. So let me make the point a little bit more <coughs> more explicit. Suppose I have something like this. Suppose I have something like this, natural log of x to x to some tiny power. Okay. Then when I differentiate the top, I get 1 over x. When I differentiate the bottom, I get 0 0.01 x to the 0 0.01 minus 1. Mm -hmm. Right? What happens when you uh, simplify that, Dana? Um, uh, okay, so then you would have um, the Just along the same lines as, yeah. as what you did here. Um, so, what? So, would it would not be infinity with that, right? Or would it? Um, tell, tell me. Just tell me. So, you got from here to here. So right? then, because because x is to a negative power, when you bring it up, um, it would be positive, and then they cancel off. Yeah, they would yep. cancel mm -hmm. out. So you get one over point zero one x to the point zero one, mm -hmm. right? Still go to uh, the oh, bottom would still yeah. go to infinity, yeah. and the whole thing would go to zero. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what's this saying? This is saying that if I took if I take um, x to the point zero 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 one, say, right? So I take some tiny. You know, I take x to some you know. You know, tiny, tiny power. Still, what's going to happen is I'm going to get I'm going to get zero. Okay. In other words, natural log of x is slower is slower than any power of any power of x. Okay. So you might think you know you can find some some power of x right because this is very a very slow growing function, right? But in fact, the natural log is sl even slower than that. Okay, just like the exponential function was faster than all all powers of x, um, the natural log is is uh, is slower than all positive powers of x. Okay, that sort of makes sense, right? Because the exponential function is the inverse of the natural log, right? If the exponential function is fast, then the natural log should be slow. Right, should be you know, commensurately slow. Okay, okay, let's go on. So, uh, what we've been showing you are examples of things that are you know, generally called like uh, the zero over zero form or the infinity over infinity form. Okay, so these are called um, these things are all called indeterminate. Indeterminate forms. Uh, zero over zero, infinity over infinity. Okay. 
Um, there are other indeterminate forms that um, what we call can reach uh, uh, if you combine it with a logarithm. So extending uh, what we call the uh, natural logarithm. Okay, and so there'll be forms called the zero to zero form, one in infinity, infinity to zero. Okay, so here's an example of a zero zero form. The limit as x goes to zero on the positive side of, of x to the x. Okay. So the base is going to zero, the power is going to zero. Right? Base is going to zero, the power is going to zero. Right? What do you think happens? What do you think happens? Yeah. Goes to one. Goes to one? Why do you think so? Because anything to the zero is one. Anything to the zero is one, right? So anything to the zero is one, right? But the, the base is becoming zero. What's zero to anything? Zero, right? Right. Zero to anything is zero. Some anything to zero is one, right? So it's, there's sort of a competition that goes on, right? And this is it again, you know, sort of the analogy of the race: who wins out, right? Who wins? Which which of these you know properties wins out? You know, does the base go to zero fast enough that the zero <coughs> wins out, or does the exponent go to zero fast enough that the exponent wins out? It's sort of a tug of war, and we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, we'll see what happens using uh, L'Hopital's rule. Okay. So, um, uh, what we do is uh, to apply L'Hopital's rule, we uh, take the logarithm. We consider the logarithm of this thing. Okay. Logarithm of the limit. So you say, okay, well, the logarithm of the limit equals the limit by continuity, it's going to be the limit of the logarithm. Properties of log, that's the same thing as x natural log x as x goes to zero. I, I can pull the exponent, pull the exponent out by the properties of log. Right. And here I'm gonna make it something that looks more like uh, the Vital's rule. So I'm gonna rewrite this as natural log over. Uh, 1 over x. Right. So that it looks like um, right, negative infinity over positive infinity. Now that it's in the right form, I'm going to apply Gilkey Dahl's rule to it. Okay. So I re at this point, yeah, we, we're, tr we're trying to bring in L'Hopital's rule, so we rearrange it in a form that L'Hopital's rule can apply to. Okay. So, right, L'Hopital's rule, we differentiate, right, the, t the, der the derivative of the top is 1 over x, the derivative of the bottom is negative 1 over x squared. Right, and you see what happens, what do you get? What do you get? Those of you who know your fractions, <laughs> you made it out of third grade or fourth grade? You get, you get negative x, right? Right, because you can flip this thing, you can multiply top and bottom by, by x squared, right? 
you get x times negative 1. It's called negative x. Right? And so you get 0. OK. OK, now be careful. Everybody makes this mistake. Uh, what we've just evaluated is the natural log of the thing we're looking for. Right? The natural log of the thing we're looking for. So what we're saying, so if we're calling this thing, you know, uh, question mark, natural log of question mark is zero. So what's question mark? Question mark is, if the natural log of question mark is zero, question mark is, no, it's not zero. It's one, right? E to the zero. Those of you who know your logarithms, right? right? This is the same thing as saying that question mark is e to the zero. Right? So question mark is e to the zero, which is one. Okay. So it does turn out to be one. Okay. The exponent wins. Yeah, but I mean, did we already establish that though? No. I thought um, for one of the earlier examples that was like that exponent. If it's to the x, would always win. Mm, no. No. We what we had was x to some power. We had x to some fixed power, like x to a million or something, over, you know. Yeah, no, it was it was not the same example. Um uh, let me try and uh, fit in one more example, because this one is interesting and important. Um, the limit of 1 plus 1 over x and x uh, as x goes to infinity. So same sort of thing. The base is going to 1. Okay? The base is going to 1, and the, the power is going to infinity. What do people think this will turn into? Who's, who's going to win, the exponent or the base? There's no right answer here. Yeah. Some of you look kind of nervous. So. Right. If the base, if you think the base is going, going fast, then one to anything is what? One to any power is one. Right, so 1 to any power is 1, but 1 plus something to the infinity power is going to be what? Going in, to be infinite, right? So again, there's some sort of play between you know, the base and the exponent, right? And it turns out to balance out at a certain point. Who knows what this limit is? E. It's E. It turns out to balance at, at, this, at E. Okay, so neither of them wins perfectly, right? It turns out that the tug of war balances at this mysterious number. Okay, and let's see how that happens using what we call's rule in the one minute we have left. Okay. So you say, okay, we're going to play the, the limit game again, uh, the natural log game again. So consider uh, uh, the natural log of this thing, right? Again, we're going to pull the natural log in because natural log is a continuous function. And again, we'll pull the exponent out because the natural log has that property. Okay, so we just play the same, same things we did before. Okay, now we we'll play again. We'll play the same trick. We say, okay, this is going to be the natural log. Oops, natural log of one plus one over x over one over x as x goes to infinity, and that turns into um, uh, zero over zero, right? Because you get natural log of one, which is zero over zero, right? So this is in zero over zero form now. And we can apply the Lopitol's rule to it. Okay. Since we're running over time, I'll just tell you, you get one. 
So you work it out, differentiate top and bottom, take the limit, and you get one. Okay. And then you go back, you go back here, and you say, well, uh, so this thing here, the natural log of it is one, and so it itself must be e to the one, namely e. Okay. So that's the sort of problem you will also see in your homework uh, tonight. Okay, that's it. <laughs>